It's been a tremendous morning of worship so far, amen? I just appreciate so much Tripp's song leading. Fantastic job, young man, and Kevin, good words around the table. Appreciate all those um, who continue to serve so diligently, our deacons who each week are able to help us with our communion. God is good, amen? It's just good to be here. You know, you go out there in the world and and it's just a rough week, and you come in here, and you get your batteries recharged. And that's at least how I am. This series of lessons, even though I only planned on two or three lessons, has been challenging to me from the sense that I have probably studied and listened and read more on this topic than I have anything in recent memory. Probably upwards of 50 or 60 plus hours reading and studying and praying just to try to wrap my mind around it, and it has been a good learning experience for me. And so, as we get into the second lesson in the sermon series that we're calling Humankind, where we're looking at a biblical worldview of us as human beings, today we come to what effectively is the results of the fall of man, and that is the sin of partiality. Now, there are many results. There's many things that we talk, can talk about that have resulted in our world since sin came into it. But the division and the hatred that we see in our world today is no doubt a part of the sin of partiality that results from the fall of man. But as I get into this this morning, I want to start with three foundational truths. Okay, And so if you're filling out your sermon snippets this morning, these are things that I think are rock-bottom truths for the Christian worldview of humankind. Things that you have to have an awareness of these things, an agreement of these things, when it comes to this particular issue. And the first one is what we talked about last week. Genesis chapter 1, 26 and following. And I invite you to start by looking at these passages of Scripture. Again, I want you to turn your Bibles to these passages today and remind yourself of these things. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle of the earth and over every creeping thing that is on the earth. And God created man in His own image. In the image of God He created them, male and female He created them and He blessed them. And so we started with this really fundamental truth, which all the rest of Scripture will echo, that all of us were created in the image of God. And if you were here on Wednesday night, we talked about how the Bible even puts forth the idea that that's why we shouldn't curse one another. Even if someone has done something despicable, uh, being the person that is to bless and pray for them and not curse them is due to the fact that that person was created in the image of God. You say, well, where does it say that, Mike? Well, go over to James chapter 3, verse 9. Write that one down. Because we talked about that in our Wednesday night Bible class. And so what we need to understand is that all of us, all humankind, have been created in the image of God. And here's a second fundamental truth that I want you to wrap your mind around. That humankind is born sinless. All right, look over at Romans chapter 5 for just a second, please. Romans chapter 5. Somebody says, Mike, you're talking about the fall of man, you're talking about Genesis chapter 3, and that seems like it was a long time ago, and you would be right. But the impact of the fall is, has been extended to all of our lives. And Paul makes that abundantly clear in Romans chapter 3, where he says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in verse 10 of that chapter, he says, There is none that are righteous, not even one. Making it very clear that nobody, Jew or Gentile, has a leg to stand on when it comes to mankind's sinfulness. We all equally are created in His image, and we all equally are sharers of the fall of man. But in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, I put 6 through 11, but I really want to focus in on verse 12. God begins through Paul to outline that this is what His plan was to redeem mankind. 
Just like we all share in the image of God and we all share in the sinfulness of humanity, we also all share in redemption. Jesus Christ came to save all of us from our sin. Not just Jews, not just Gentiles, all of us. But in Romans chapter 5, as Paul is outlining that, and he gets down to verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered toward the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, how? Because all sinned. And so human beings are born sinless into a sinful world. And as they grow up, they reach what we commonly call the age of accountability. You know, just this past year, um, I was blessed to, to baptize another one of my children into Christ. That's one of the greatest feelings that a dad can ever feel. And it's one of the most challenging things as a parent to see your children growing up in this world and you see sin starting to enter into their young lives. I think we all understand what I'm talking about here. As you live in this earth, we all are born into this sinful world. There comes a point in which we are no longer sinless like we were at birth. Rather, sin comes into our life and we die spiritually. You can go to Romans chapter 7 and Paul will lay that out a little bit more. All right, now here's how all of this relates to this lesson that we're talking about this morning. Humankind is not born racist, prejudiced, or partial. You are not born a prejudiced person. And somebody says, well, Mike, how do you become a prejudiced person? How do you become a partial person? How do you become a person with, with racist tendencies and motives? And we talked all about some of that language and how it can be difficult to understand and parse out in the last lesson. Well, the answer is, you learn it. You learn it from the other sinful people that are around you who are prejudiced or partial or racist or whatever those things. No one is born racist or prejudiced or partial. Now I want to pause right here and just, like I like to say sometimes, wax elephants or wax eloquent, however you say that. I want to pause right here and tell you a couple of funny, one's a funny story and one just happened yesterday that makes this point. In 2017, Noah and I were in Tana Island, Vanuatu, and we were riding in the back of the truck. And there was a group of small boys, and they all play soccer down there, right? Everybody. If you go outside of the United States, you can bet that the people love soccer, right? Football, as they will call it. Not the same as our football, right? And there were these little boys, and they were being walked by their coaches, who were young men in their 20s and 30s. And as we're riding in, the, in this remote South Pacific Island, in the back of this truck, one of the little boys, probably seven or eight years old, in Bislama, the language that they speak down there, yelled at us and said, Hello, white men! To which Aaron, who was a missionary there for seven years and lived on that island for an entire year, yelled back at them, Hello, black children! And we, they laughed. We laughed. We all had a smile on our face. And we went on about our way. Now why is that? Could you imagine, okay, this is a little funny, but serious too. Could you imagine some of the communities that we live in, that kind of interaction happening? Right? Let's just be honest. If we're, if we're looking at the problem, the part of the problem is the culture in which we are living in. Can you imagine a, a young 20-something black man going through a predominantly white neighborhood? Hello, white men! Can you imagine me going through a predominantly black neighborhood saying, Hello, black children! You're all looking at me stone-faced right now. And I'm just being real. Right? Why in the world, in Tana, Vanuatu, can that conversation be humorous and funny? Well, there's a few reasons behind that. You know, the first white men that came to Vanuatu, you know who they were? They were missionaries. They came down there and taught people about the gospel. And then there was people from the Peace Corps who came down there and dug wells. 
Ah, but if you go down to Vanuatu in 2020 and you start talking about the China man, ah. You see, because as our brother Tom was telling me, the man from China came down there and promised to build a road and I went to work for him. And when I didn't work hard enough, he hit me in my face and he spit on me and he treated me like a slave. Ah, so then when you start talking to Tom and those other very humble Christians in this third world country, when you start talking about the man from China, then you start to see the anger in their eyes. And you start to say, there it is. There's that hatred that I see in the United States of America. Give it another couple of generations. And how do you think that will play out in that place? You didn't inherit the culture that you were born into, or you didn't choose is what I mean to say. You were born into this culture based on the consequences of generations of people who have gone before us. But what you do get to choose is what you do in that culture. Yesterday, just yesterday, I was at Pointer Rocks Park and I took my three youngest ones down there to the park in the evening time and there was a couple of birthday parties and there was an all different types of racial backgrounds of children on the playground. Kids run out there and just like that, they're playing tag together. Just like that. Hey, you want to play? Yeah, let's go play. It didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter anything about that. In fact, this one little girl, she was about seven or eight years old, African-American, she comes in up to me sitting there on the bench and Meredith's dolls are there and she says, can I play with these? And I said, sure, honey, play with those. And she starts playing and then there's a Cheeto on the ground and the other kids go, look at those ants. And Meredith goes, that's like, that's like that movie we saw last night. I said, oh yeah, honey, I shrunk the kids. And the little girl playing with the dolls go, I know that movie. I watched it at the theater last week. I said, honey, that movie came out in 1989. <laughs> and she said, oh, that's right, it was Frozen 2. <laughs> and pretty soon, me and this girl that I just met, 15 seconds, and Meredith are going, oh. You laugh because you've seen Frozen 2. And so we go back to our car and they go back to their birthday party and I'm driving off and it hits me what Jesus said. It hits me. Here's the answer. Unless you become converted and become in your mind like one of these children, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Why are children able to run out onto a playground regardless of color, gender, any of those things and play tag with other children that they literally just met five seconds? It's because they're not born racist or prejudiced or partial. And here's the other thing that we need to recognize as part of these fundamental truths. All of us have been impacted and have our own biases and our own ideas about this because of the culture that we grew up in. And this is why Jesus says, you must be converted in heart. You must reject the sin of partiality. And so somebody says, Mike, why do you keep using that word partial? Why don't you just use the word racist or prejudice? Well, if you do a search in your Bible of the words racist or prejudice, you won't find it there. Part of that is because the, the term race, we talked about that as, as coming from the idea of, of Darwinian evolution. There's a couple of places in the Bible that speaks of race, but it doesn't uses it, uh, use that word in the same way that we do. It uses it more to do with the nationality, Jew or Gentile ethnic backgrounds. But the reason I'm using this word partiality is because that's the word the Bible uses. The Bible uses the word partiality. And, and remember in our sermon last week, I said part of the problem with uh, 
this whole struggle that we have going on right now is people keep talking past one another, right? Like one of the things that I kept understanding and coming across, it, even with the word like the term racist was, that word in and of itself can have one meaning to one group of people and a completely different meaning to another group of people. Somebody says, huh? Huh? Yeah. We can't even agree on the definition of a word. And so we go back to the Bible and we look at this word partial and partiality and we start to see the idea that God is not partial and He expects us to be impartial in our relationship towards one another. And so in the remainder of this sermon this morning, I want to look at three points about the sin of partiality flesh this out, and then we'll be done this morning. But the first of these three points is this, that God is not partial. Open to the book of Deuteronomy, if you would, please. This morning, we're going to look at three passages that establish this in the New Testament. And because our brother Vince has already read from Acts chapter 10, you know that the book of Acts teaches this as well in the New Testament. But in Deuteronomy chapter 1, we'll start in the beginning of this book. In verse 17, the Word of God says, You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not fear man, for the judgment is God's. And this is Moses giving instructions to those who would judge among other human beings. And the instruction is, you shall not show partiality. You ever seen the picture of uh, woman justice? What is it that she's wearing around her eyes? A blindfold. Well, that's rooted back in this idea that justice ought to be blind, devoid of partiality. Now, is it? No. No, it's really not. At least not in a worldly sense. But if you go over to Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 19 now, what you're going to see is this commandment to not show partiality is rooted in the character and nature of God Himself. Because God says in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 19, and then we're going to jump back to 10 and verse 17, You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. And you shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of justice. Justice and only justice you shall pursue, that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 10, just a few chapters back, in verse 17, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17, It says, for the Lord, your God, is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who does not show partiality, nor does He take a bribe. And so we learn that the command and the teaching in Scriptures to not be partial as we mete out justice and treat one another is rooted not just in God's law, but it's rooted in God's character. And we know that early Christians even had a hard time with this. Go to Acts chapter 6 as they're struggling with the food distribution to two different groups of widows. And even Peter, the great apostle, struggled with this in the passage that Vince read to us. Where God had to give Peter this great vision to get Peter to understand, I am not partial. And Peter says, I get it now. God is not partial, rather He seeks to bless all with the word of Jesus Christ by those who have been oppressed by the devil. And so the second bullet point here in this first point says, God's laws reflect His character. So if you go back to Exodus chapter 23, 2 and 3, write that down. Or you look at the wisdom that God shares in the wisdom literature, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 5. You're going to see many places in which when God tells us to do something, it is because it is consistent with who He is. We're to be conformed to His image. And so someone says to us, but wait, what about Israel? Was God not partial with Israel? Unless we forget that in our thinking, we're, we're not... God is not bound to our timeline. 
You go all the way back to God's promise that He made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And you realize that God's promise that He was making through Abraham was intended to bless all of the nations. The promise of Abraham was given to all of us, Jew and Gentile. And Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 25 is a tremendous passage which speaks about how God is going to bring all nations and reconcile all nations unto Himself. And we know that He did that through Jesus Christ. And what do we see in Jesus when we read about Jesus in the Gospels? We see someone who was impartial. I mean, just think about the message of Jesus in light of the struggles of humanity today. He was born to a marginalized group of Jews in a, in a good-for-nothing town as far as the Jews were concerned. Grew up in Nazareth, and we know what those first disciples thought of that. Can anything good come from Nazareth? He hung around with the oppressed and the poor and the marginalized of society. He himself was not rich. He didn't come into this world as, as the ruling class, as this rich Roman. Everywhere he went, he was beaten, he was oppressed, he was abused, and then finally, in the greatest miscarriage of justice, he is hung on a cross, and he dies the, the death of a criminal, a murderer, though he had never sinned even once. Jesus Christ, God incarnate, was one who knew injustice. He knew oppression. He is, therefore, the perfect individual to be an advocate in this regard. Isn't He? He really is. And so we read in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20 and verse 21, as these people came and they were really trying to set Jesus up, but nevertheless, they said this about His character. And this is repeated in Matthew and Mark as well, and you can see those passages on the screen there. But in Luke chapter 20 and verse 21, it says this, They questioned Him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and that you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Did you catch that? Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any. Well, what did the crowd, what did the people notice and observe about Jesus Christ? They noticed and observed that Jesus was impartial towards humanity in His time on earth. And so we look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and we think about God and His character, and we think about what they were saying about Jesus in His time on earth, and we see that the Godhead, God's nature, is unity perfected in diversity. And therefore the Apostle Paul can say in Ephesians 4, 1-6, through Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience showing tolerance for one another in love. And then here it is, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And you'll notice in this list of seven ones, he mentions the Godhead. There is one body, and there is one Spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. And so as we remember the passage we read last week from Luke chapter 4, 24 through 30, when God chose to come into this world, and when Jesus Christ came into this world, Jesus was a proclaimer of righteousness, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, and He was an advocate for the oppressed. This is who Jesus was when He came down to this earth. And then He died at the hands of lawless, partial, prejudiced people. And he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And then on a Sunday, a long time ago, he was resurrected. But before he went back and ascended back into heaven, he said, I'm coming back. This you know, 
But as we think about the lesson that we are studying this morning, one thing that the Scripture makes very clear is that heaven will be impartial. Heaven will be impartial. If you go back to Isaiah 25 and then also Isaiah 65, go back and look at those great prophecies. They speak of a time in which God is going to bring all the nations under His rule. They look forward to the new heaven and the new earth in which God is going to dwell in the midst of human beings in an impartial way, true to His character. And if you go to the book of Revelation, which gives us a glimpse of the future that will be among us in passages like Revelation chapter 7, and then I'm going to go over to Revelation chapter 21, verses 24 and 26, what we see is that heaven will be impartial. Revelation chapter 21, verses 24 and 26 says, The nations will walk by its lamp, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And verse 26, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abominations or lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then you think about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount as He stood up there and began to speak to the people. And He spoke about us. And He said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 17, He said, You are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I've been saying this for some time now as I've interacted with folks. And I'll probably continue to say this. Revival and people turning back to Jesus is the answer. That's the solution to the problems that we're facing in our world. And when we think about our responsibility as a church, we know that human beings were created in the image of God. We know that human beings are sinless at at birth. We know that no human being was ever born racist or prejudiced or partial. We know that God's very character is impartiality. We know that His Son, when He came down to this earth, knew oppression and He knew injustice and and yet hanging on a cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And we know, we know that the new heaven and the new earth is going to be impartial. And so we say, what should we be doing in the time that we have left? And and as a church, well, we should be this reflection of the kingdom that is to come. This city of God amongst the city of men. A city of refuge where people could come and, and, and find refuge from the world. A place where people can come and find impartiality. A place where people can be introduced to a Savior who understands the discrimination and the injustices and the hate that they've experienced in this world. That's who God expects His church to be. A group of people who is bringing the kingdom of God to earth through the lives that they live. Through the lives that they live. And as I look to this world that we live in, there's a real need for us to roll up our sleeves and get busy and be that kind of people. I think the world is waiting on us. There's a sense of urgency is a word that I might use. Almost 57 years ago today, 
As Dr. King stood up at the Lincoln Memorial and he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, in about the fourth or fifth paragraph down in that particular speech, it begins with those words right there. With those words right there. The urgency of now. And brethren, I can tell you, 57 years later, I can still feel and see those words. There is an urgency of now. There's a sense in which we need to, we need to get busy and be the kingdom on earth that God needs us to be. Alright, as we close out this sermon, if you want to go ahead and pull out your phone and go ahead and post this. <laughs> all right. Things that I, I thought about as I was reading through and studying through this. I, I, I was reading an article that was written, and actually it was an interview from Brother John DeBerry, who's a preacher, gospel preacher, is also a legislator in the state of Tennessee in Memphis. And when I read this particular quote, I said, that's it. John wins the internet for the year. Get this man a trophy. And as they're interviewing him about his Christian faith, he said, you know, it's not about an elephant or a donkey. It's about a lamb. It's about a lamb. And so when we get down to the end of this lesson this morning, and when we think about what God has been saying to us through these passages, we come back to that Samaritan illustration. Who's my neighbor? The answer is the one who's oppressed. It might be a person of color who's grown up in the deep south and their entire lives they have faced systemic discrimination. If they're oppressed, they're your neighbor. It might be a police officer who the night before saw his fellow officer, his face get bashed in with a bottle filled with concrete, who doesn't know if he's going to go home to his wife. If you see him with bloodshot eyes standing in Starbucks to grab a cup of coffee, if he's oppressed, he's your neighbor. It might be a small child fighting for life in the womb. As the abortion doctor tries to, to find that little body to put a needle into it. If the unborn are oppressed, they're your neighbor. I've got this bracelet on my wrist right here, and it says 22 a day. 22 a day. Because statistically, 22 United States veterans commit suicide every day single day. We've asked them to go to Afghanistan and Iraq and all over this world since 2001. And now, every day, every single day, 22 of them commit suicide. They are oppressed. They're your neighbor. So when we ask ourselves the question, who is my neighbor? It's really simple. The one who's oppressed. You may not understand what they're dealing with. You may not understand the PTSD of the soldier or the discrimination of the person who's been discriminated against. You may not understand the, the challenges wrapped up in, in all of the nuances. Well, we just need to listen and talk. And we need to realize that we need to be the neighbor to the one who's oppressed. Because that is what God has said over and over and over again in His Word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come into Your presence. We ask You, God, to come into our lives. And we ask You, Lord, to Help us to set aside our biases and our anger to be more like Jesus. God, we need to be more like Him. We ask You to come into the members of this congregation and that You will mold and shape our lives in such a way, Lord, that we can reflect the city of God amongst the city of men.
Help us, God, to champion the cause of the oppressed. Help us to be compassionate and tender towards them. Father, we pray for even our enemies. We pray that their hearts will be turned back to You in revival and restoration and repentance. Lord, thank You for this assembly this morning in which we could come into Your presence and study Your Word. And truly, You are a God of impartiality who loves all humanity so much so that You would send Your Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. We pray and ask for the strength to live out His commands in our life this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been very kind in your attention this morning. And the only thing I want to say to you this morning is, thank you for that. And if any of you has any needs whatsoever, it's our custom to offer an invitation at the end of the lesson. And if you need the prayers of this church, if you need to learn more about how to find God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ, I'd be glad to help you. I want you to come forward as we stand and sing.